and after that winter. Many years later, as an adult, I asked other family members if they'd ever heard her story. None of them had. So I couldn't help wondering why Granny had chosen me, her great-granddaughter, to share the story with. Perhaps she somehow knew that one day I would share her story with other people like you. And perhaps she wanted me to understand as I grew up how fortunate I was just to be free. Some of you will remember February 1st, 1960, four college students from North Carolina A&T sat down at a lunch counter in Woolworth's five and 10 cent store in Greensboro, North Carolina, and they ordered coffee. When they were refused service because they were black, they stayed on those stools until the store closed. The next day, they were back with a bunch of their friends, and as quickly as they were hauled away by the police, they were replaced on the stools by other students. This was the beginning of the sit-in demonstrations all across the South and into some northern cities. And as word spread through the media, other students picked up the protests and even carried it to other public places. Well, ultimately, the bad publicity and the loss of business due to the presence of the demonstrators and the police brought about desegregation of lunch counters all across the country because of those four boys. And as I stood in front of my television set in Carson, California, when those boys were served that cup of coffee, I stood there with tears in my eyes. Now, some people might say, big deal, it was just a lousy cup of coffee. But it was more than that. And it was especially meaningful to me. And you'll understand why after you hear my story, which I call Five and Dime. Mama promised to take me shopping with her that Saturday morning. So I was up early and I got dressed and combed my hair and did my chores so I would be ready to leave when she was ready. You see, the bus didn't come into our neighborhood. We had to walk half a mile to the first bus stop. And then we rode the bus for half an hour to the first shopping center. We got off and we went to Woolworths five and ten cent store. Oh, I love the five and dime because it had stuff I could buy with my own money if I saved up my allowance for several weeks. And that day, I felt rich. I had a dollar seventy-five cents, and that was a lot of money for a ten-year-old. Normally, Mama made me stay really close to her when we went shopping, but that day. When I asked if I could go browsing one aisle over, she said yes. <laughs> I felt so grown up browsing the store all by myself with my own money to spend. Well, maybe I'll buy something for Mama, I thought. So I looked first on one side of the aisle and then the other, all the way down. But, but nothing really appealed to me. And I was just about to turn around and go back when I realized I had come to the lunch counter. Oh, it was all shiny chrome, mirrors on the back wall, tall stools with red leather cushions, and large glass dispensers of red and orange drink. There were wall posters of smiling people eating ice cream out of dishes. Oh, I was just enthralled. I was also suddenly very thirsty. So the only other person around was the lady behind the counter. She was a grandmotherly kind of lady. She had on a pink uniform and a pink and white striped apron and a little 
pink sailboat kind of hat perched on top of her head and her white hair hung down her back in a, in a white hairnet. I was, I was kind of small for my age, so I kind of had to struggle to get up on one of those high stools. But I, I managed, and I, I put my elbows up on the counter, and I smiled real nice-like, and I said very politely, may I have an orange soda, please? I can't serve you here, said the woman with a frown. Oh, oh, but, but, but I, I, I have money, see? It's not that. I just can't serve you at this counter. Why? I can't serve coloreds at this counter. You have to go to the other counter at the back of the store on the other side. You can get your orange soda there. I sat silently staring at her, trying to understand what she meant. If there was another counter in the store, that could serve me, then why couldn't this one? I knew I was colored, but I had money to spend, so what difference should it make? I, I could feel a lump developing in my chest, but I wasn't going to let that lady see me cry. I don't know what expression showed on my face, but she came over and leaned down on the counter, and she said quietly, I'm truly sorry, honey. Now you run along and go get your orange soda. I slid down off the stool and made my way back down the aisle to my mother. What's the matter? She asked as soon as she looked at me. And as best I could, I tried to explain to her what had just happened. She put her arm around my shoulder and she said, I'm sorry, honey. I should have warned you. Come on, let's go home. But you didn't buy anything yet. We don't need anything from this store she said angrily. On the bus ride home, my mother had the conversation with me she probably should have had years earlier. She explained to me what segregation was and why that woman wouldn't serve me because of the color of my skin. But that's stupid, I said. Yes, it is, she replied. But you mustn't let other people's stupidity keep you from having the things that you want. It might be a little harder and take a little longer, but you can have whatever you're willing to work for. Now, this was the first really grown-up conversation my mother had had with me, so I didn't even realize until she signaled it was time to get off that we had taken a different bus. We got off at the supermarket, and my mother did grand-scale shopping. And among the things she bought was a large bottle of orange soda and a quart of vanilla ice cream. And we even took a taxi cab home so that ice cream wouldn't melt. And that evening for dinner, Mama fixed a lot of the things I really liked. Macaroni and cheese, steamed spinach. I was one of those kids who loved spinach. Pan brown pork chops simmered in a brown gravy and cornbread. Oh, it was wonderful. Then after dinner, she shooed my father and my little brother and me into the living room promising dessert. Well, we never had dessert on Saturdays. That was always reserved for Sundays and holidays. But after a few minutes wait, she came into the room with a tray, which she sat down on the coffee table and on the tray were three tall iced tea glasses and a little glass for my little brother. And they were filled to the brim with orange soda and big globs of vanilla ice cream. And into each glass, she had stuck two drinking straws and a long handle spoon, just like at a soda fountain. They were beautiful. And as I raised my glass, and took my first sip of that smooth, cool sweetness. I looked across the table at my mother's smiling face, and I never loved her more than I did at that very moment. And I remembered her words from that bus. It might be a little harder, 
and take a little longer, but you can have whatever you're willing to work for. And I remember that lesson from that day until now. But I've also remembered the real world lesson I learned at that five and dime. I call this next story the White House. Now, as I was growing up, the movies and pictures and magazines always showed that white people had much nicer homes than black people. Big houses with lots of furniture, dining room tables piled high with food. White people were always dressed very nicely, and they drove fancy cars. Well, they must be better than us somehow, I thought. But I really wanted to see inside of a White House for myself. Well, I finally got my chance. Joyce Jackson, who was a friend of my mother's, made her living cleaning white folks' houses. But she didn't do ironing. And she had a regular who was looking for somebody else to do ironing for her. Mrs. Jackson suggested to my mother that maybe I would like to pick up a few dollars doing some ironing for Mrs. Hemsley. Well, I didn't know. But you see, my mother had taught me how to iron early on because she didn't like to do it either. So by the time I was 15, I was doing all of my family's ironing. So when the idea was suggested to me, I said, yes. I didn't have a summer job, and we sure could use the extra money. Well, Mrs. Jackson made the arrangements and gave me the directions to Mrs. Hemsley's house. So 7.30 one morning, there I was, after taking two buses and walking several blocks, walking through an all-white suburban neighborhood. A woman came out of her door in a robe and slippers to pick up her newspaper, and she stared at me, and she watched me all the way to the end of the block. A man who was watering his lawn with a water hose was so distracted by my presence that he unwittingly turned the hose on his own car parked in the driveway with the windows open. Well, finally I got to the right house and knocked on the door. A woman came to the door wearing a plaid robe, big pink rollers in her hair, and she was barefoot. Mrs. Hemsley, I asked. Yes, what is it? Oh, you must be that ironing girl. Well, come in, come in. I stepped into the living room and looked around. Sofa, two chairs, floor lamp, and a little boy about five sitting on the bare wooden floor watching a black and white TV set, the kind with a big magnifying glass in front. He was in footed pajamas and eating cereal out of a bowl that rested on the floor in between his outstretched legs. She turned to the little boy and said, Mark, this is Barbara. She's going to do some work for us today. Say hi. Hi, he said without even turning around. She shrugged and then directed me to follow her into the dining area, which was an extension of the living room. It held a table for mica and chrome and a little china cabinet. The table was piled high with clothes, as were two laundry baskets on the floor. The ironing board was set up next to the table. Everything's there, she said. I knew I was going to be there all day from the looks of those piles of clothes. Well, she just turned and walked away down the hall without another word to the sound of a, toward the sound of a crying baby. Well, I looked at all of those clothes, and I started to sort them out into two piles, those that could be dry ironed and those that had to be dampened. And I started in on the dry ironing. Well, in about 20 minutes, Mrs. Hemsley was back. She now had on slacks and a men's shirt. The pink rollers were gone, but she was still barefoot. And she had a baby slung on her hip. She went into the kitchen and took a baby bottle from the refrigerator to warm. She ignored me completely. Uh, Mrs. Hemsley, I asked, 